Welcome back, welcome back. With the global slowdown really starting to bite, the world's economies are in a difficult situation. A successful resolution to the stalled Doha trade talks is more important than ever. But the talks which began back in 2001 are mired in differences between, for example, the developed and developing countries. But the new EU trade commissioner, Cathy Ashton, has signalled a new attempt to find a way through, and I'm delighted to say she's here with us right now. Cathy, welcome. Thank you, David. Let's start at the basic thing. The news that you uh, trumpeted, that the effort to make the Doha round work, what will the Doha round working mean in simple terms? Very simply, we've got to do two things. One is to stop the world moving backwards into raising barriers preventing trade from operating properly and not helping us out of this recession. We know that from history, that it doesn't work. And then secondly, to create a new opportunity for all of us to be able to trade more efficiently, for businesses with a new set of rules to be able to operate globally in some cases or simply to have new markets. And that's the purpose of the new round. And these particular talks, December the 13th is supposed to be the day when this will happen? It's a possible date. Um, what we're waiting for at the moment is that the two chairs of the negotiation, those who are dealing with agriculture, those dealing with other issues than agriculture, industrial products and so on, have got to now decide if they've got enough to be able to write the words for the final negotiation, literally the words. If they're able to do that, then Pascal Lamy will decide whether on the 13th or maybe a bit later he wants to bring ministers back to try and do the final negotiation. And is the re recession a bad time to do this, or in fact it's absolutely the essential time to do it? There's more need to do it during a recession than not. Well, you're absolutely right. It's the essential time to do it. For the reasons I, I've said, you know, that if you have a position where countries are thinking how are they going to support their industry, support their businesses, how are their economies going to fare in what will be a difficult economic time, then one of the questions is how do we make sure that trade continues and getting countries to resist the idea of putting up barriers because we know that doesn't work. And well, that's what happened last time exactly. after 1929 and 31, isn't it? Exactly. The lessons are there to be learned. But it is a temptation. It's a temptation that countries will have to resist very hard. But better to resist it because there are real opportunities and ways in which they can support their industry to be able to trade in this new framework. What about, what about the, um, the words of President-elect uh, Barack Obama? Uh, everybody interpreted what he said as leaning towards protectionism rather than leaning towards free trade. You say we need him to lean towards free trade. Everything I've read about what the President-elect has said suggests to me that he wants America to be a, a global force operating with other economies and to be able to play its full role and, of course, to protect and grow his economy. To do that, he will also have looked at the lessons of the past and he will be aware of the dangers and difficulties of protectionism. So I hope that what he'll be doing when he becomes president is looking at the agreement if we reached it, seeing the benefits to the United States and then working with his industry, whether it's the car manufacturers, whether it's agriculture, to provide the opportunities that these talks will have provided for them to be able to trade. And so it's really tariff barriers, tariff barriers, tariff barriers that's the basis of what you've got to deal with, is it? Or are there other issues that are almost as important? All of the issues around trade are about how do you make it easier for your people to export and how do you do it in a way that means you also keep an eye on your own economy and you provide opportunities for your own business, but you don't, if you like, flood your own market in a way that makes it impossible for homegrown produce to survive. So it's a kind of balance. It's a balance between keeping um, barriers low, but making sure that where they do exist, there's a purpose to them, making sure that it's understood what those are for, and that there's a sort of symmetry to this part of how we operate. But this round was also about developing countries and recognising that their economies, again, particularly in times of economic recession, need to be supported more effectively. In the end, it's good for all of us. If their economies grow, we can trade more effectively with them. They'll buy our produce too. Well, it's great to have you with us, Cathy. Absolute delight. Thank you so much, David.
Tension remains high between India and Pakistan in the aftermath of the Mumbai attacks, which killed more than 170 people. India blames Pakistan-based militants, though the Pakistan government denies any involvement. The attacks are not isolated incidents. There have been scores of outrages in recent years in India, Pakistan and Bangladesh, with many different groups blamed. This week in London, Major General Munir Uzuman, the former military advisor and chief of staff to the Bangladesh president, said South Asia is infested with the threat of violent terrorism. Infested with it. Well, he's with me now. General, welcome. It's very good to see you. Thank you. In what way is it infested and how did it, how did it happen? Uh, if we just scan the general scenario of South Asia, uh, we would see that the center of gravity of terrorism has probably shifted to South Asia. Countries starting from Afghanistan to Pakistan, now to India, to Bangladesh, to Sri Lanka, also in Nepal, are all affected by violent terrorism. And some of the most violent terrorist acts are now taking place in countries of Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. Sri Lanka also has had a very long history of terrorism and insurgency. So as we, as we see, the whole region has been affected by very violent nature of terrorism, and it is perhaps the epicenter of global terrorism that is there. And how many terrorist groups are involved? When you say it's the epicenter, how many different terrorist groups and which is the most powerful? Uh, there are a number of fractional groups in each country. There are country-specific groups. Uh, but the groups that uh, operate on an Islamic militancy basis, they generally have some sort of a linkage directly or at least morally or on the basis of the spiritual linkages to the basic Al-Qaeda. Then there we also have the Sri Lankan LTTE who are fighting for the Tamil homeland, which is also listed as a terrorist organization. They have an ethnic background. We now also have Maoist insurgency in Nepal that has now formally come to the political process and have now formed a government but there are also Maoist insurgency belts operating within the Indian state and the Indian territory. So we have Islamic militancy, we have ethnic militancy in the form of the Tamil LTT, we also have the Maoist. We also are now seeing the rise of Hindu fundamentalism in India. So that is a, again a disturbing element of the overall scene of militancy and terrorism in South Asia. And why is all this why is all this happening or exploding in a way now? Is it, is it particularly because of political unrest or what? Uh, I think the wave started after the uh, first Afghan war or the anti-Soviet war when the Taliban's captured the area and then developed the linkages to various groups also along with Al-Qaeda to the various Islamic militancy groups within South Asia. There is also a general nature of unrest within the political system of South Asia. There is also the problem of ethnic integration in some of the states. There is also widespread economic and social deprivation in many of the societies in South Asia, which makes it a happy breeding ground for this kind of militancy and terrorism, and also a ground for recruitment. And of course, in your own country, in Bangladesh, there is the upcoming uh general election isn't there uh, and and the and the two parties still led by the two ladies um are pretty close in terms of people's estimate of the polling at the moment isn't that right yes yeah, that's right we are scheduled to have the elections on the 29th of december yeah and the uh, two major political coalitions who are coming to the elections are led by the two former prime ministers the two ladies Sheikh Hasina and Begum Khaled Azia, who have been both former prime ministers of the country, and they are leading the two political coalitions, one the four-party coalition of Khalid Azia under the Grand Alliance led by Sheikh Hasina. And, and whereas in many countries the leaders, when they get into the House of Commons or into the Senate or wherever it is, they, they may attack each other, but they're actually, when the debate is over, they're friends and so on, it would be 
wrong to portray, portray these two, two ladies as friends, wouldn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, the two ladies haven't even talked to each other for the last 17 years. Fantastic. Absolutely incredible. Must make running the country when one of them is in power and the other isn't very difficult. It becomes very difficult of the nature of dysfunctional interpersonal relationships that they have has a direct shadow on the quality and the level of governance they bring to the country. And unless there is a functional relationship between them, uh, I think we will again go into a state where things become very politically dysfunctional. And that, that is a real danger. That's a real danger. And the two ladies also have a fairly tight grip on their own parties. So if their personal relationships become dysfunctional, like it has remained for the last 17 years, then the relationship between the two parties, the party in government and the party in opposition, also remains very dysfunctional. And that is the reason we have not had a participatory parliament for the last 15 years. The three parliaments that we have had after general elections were always boycotted by the opposition party. So the nature of parliamentary democracy in Bangladesh became very dysfunctional. Very dysfunctional. Well, we, we wish democracy well, whatever the results are, and we thank you. And, and putting the focus there of terrorism in South Asia is, is, a, is a very interesting, important point, I think, because not a lot, not a lot of people know that as Sir Michael Caine would have said. Thank you very much indeed, General, for being Thank with you. us. Thank you. Thank you. The world's greatest chess player turned politician, Gary Kasparov, joins me after the news, which is next.